Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to be not at just a conference, but the conference, to talk about what New Harvest does, and specifically my work in creating a new facet of agriculture where, where we can produce things like meat, milk, eggs, leather, and silk from cell cultures rather than whole animals. So I'll start just by describing what New Harvest is. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization that is advancing fi the field of cellular agriculture. And that's what I call this field where we produce foods from cell cultures instead of from plants or animals. And what's interesting about our organization is that we're a nonprofit research institute. So we are supported entirely by the donations of people from around the world who want to see a new world where we can move beyond animal agriculture and introduce these new uh, types of methods for producing foods. So I want to start by just setting the stage. The stage is that animal products today are amazing. Uh, they're so incredibly functional. Uh, there are things that plant products just can't do the way animal products can. So for example, the creaminess of milk or the meltiness of cheese uh, or the, the ability for muscle fibers to hold together fat and water like it happens in sausages and hot dogs. Um, animal products just have these functionalities that can't be replaced by various plant proteins. But there are lots of problems that come with animal products. One of them is that they ruin the environment. So today, 70% of agricultural land is used by livestock. And I like this aerial photo because it's actually a photo of um, livestock cows on the side there. And this is all the runoff that comes from those cows. And that runoff is full of all kinds of fertilizers, which means that it causes the growth of lots of algae, which of course causes dead zones. So in the United States, the entire Gulf of Mexico on the bottom of the Mississippi River has been filled with all these fertilizers. And it's ultimately a dead zone where nothing can grow anymore. So it affects water pollution. It also contributes to air pollution. Um, it's just something that's very, very difficult for the planet to maintain at the level that we're producing animals today. The other problem with animal products is that they are very unsafe. So not only are they the cause of most foodborne illness, so even when you have spinach that has E. coli on it, it usually comes from fertilizers that have, I'm sorry, from manures from animals. Um, so on top of the foodborne illness, there's also the much more pressing issue of epidemic viruses. So here's an example of an H1N, or sorry, H7N9 bird flu outbreak. And the attempt to contain these outbreaks, um, the only way you contain them is by trying to cull a whole bunch of animals very quickly. So you have to get rid of these huge populations of chickens. Um, last spring, there was a huge, huge avian flu outbreak in the Midwest, and they had to kill 50 million chickens just to prevent that flu from spreading. So even if, um, not only is that dangerous from a public health perspective, but it's just bad for business to have to try and kill 50 million chickens in order to contain these viruses. And last but not least, one of the other problems is that animal products come from animals. And when we're trying to increase any kind of efficiencies to feed more people, it leads to problems in the way that animals are treated. So there are issues that come from creating animal products despite how functionally wonderful they are and how delicious they taste. So what we're trying to propose is this. What if this was the farm? Um, this is actually the Sam Adams Brewery in Boston. And when we look at this brewery, we think of it as a very controlled environment. Um, but the people who run it are not mad scientists, but instead craftspeople or artisans. And, but they are still microbiologists. They're controlling an environment where they're inputs and outputs, and usually people who work with cultures would say there's, there's a hand and an art associated with working with a living culture in the way that there is with working with animals. Um, so what if this was a vision where meat or milk came from a farm like this instead of a farm that we're familiar with? I think that is very possible in this new world where <laughs> cellular agriculture is something that happens very commonly. So what is cellular agriculture? Um, it is simply the farming of agricultural products from cell cultures. And I, we're probably more famous for advancing cultured meat in particular, but this is any kind of animal product. This could be things like silk. This could be things like leather. This could be 
flavors, fragrances. It could be so much more than just meat, milk, and eggs. But that's where we started. So here are three prototypes of projects that we have started. Uh, the first one in the, on the top there is a meringue that was made with cell-cultured uh, ovalbumin, which is the egg whites. And what's brilliant about making an egg white from so I'll, I'll, first I'll explain the process. You take the gene for the egg white protein and put it into a yeast so that when the yeast is brewing, it is churning out these egg white proteins. And what's so great about these egg white proteins is that they are exactly egg white proteins. So you can plug them into every application of where you would plug an egg white. There are people working on plant-based alternatives to egg proteins, but the problem with that is you need to formulate it differently every single time. So if you're making a sauce, the type of proteins you would make for an egg-based sauce will be different from the type of proteins you would use to make a cake, or the type of proteins you would use to make a meringue. But because we are making those exact same proteins, you just plug it out. So you can make something like a meringue, just as like with these proteins, in the same way you would make a creamy sauce. Um, so that project became Clara Foods, which is now a company in San Francisco that is continuing to make egg proteins using a yeast fermentation method. Uh, on the side there is milk made without cows. So that was actually one of our very first projects where we decided we were going to use yeast again to make casein proteins. And casein proteins are the ones that make cheese what it is. Um, they're the ones that allow cheese to be melty and gooey and solid and, and do all those kind of interesting things that you can't do with a plant-based cheese. Um, have, have any of you tried a plant-based cheese before? So a couple of you. Um, it's just not the same. <laughs> it, can, it can do some things, but it can't do other things. It can't, it can't do all of those things. And so in trying to make casein from yeast directly, we can make a milk that not only has the same flavor profile as milk, but then can be cultured into yogurt or cultured into cheese and be exactly as functional as the yogurt and cheese that we're familiar with. And that project became a company called Mufri, which is also in San Francisco. And I recently tasted a yogurt that they made, which is very exciting. Um, beside that is the cell cultured hamburger, which was very famously tasted in August of 2013. And this is a little bit different because it's not made through a yeast fermentation method. Um, this is made via tissue engineering. So you collect cells, muscle cells from a cow, and then multiply those in a nutrient rich medium outside of the, an animal and collect all those tissues to put together to put, to make a hamburger patty. Now, the, the, the theory behind producing meat in cell culture is that by avoiding having to raise whole animals, it'll actually be much more efficient. Now, this hamburger in particular was definitely not much more efficient because it was the very, very first hamburger, in the same way that the very, very first computer was something that was completely impractical. Um, this hamburger probably, well, it had to, it took many, many years to culture it. It took many hands to culture it, and it cost $33,000 to produce. But of course, for a very first biotech uh, prototype, that's actually not such a bad price. Um, so there's actually been three instances of uh, prototype cultured meat products. Uh, one is this hamburger. The second is a cell cultured steak chip, which I got to try. So the interesting thing about tissue is that it can grow very thin very easily, but in order for it to grow thicker, it needs the nutrients to penetrate the tissue. So the reason why our bodies can be so thick is because we have uh, vasculature or veins and arteries that bring the nutrients up into our tissue. But if you wanted to grow something very, very thin, that's very, very easy. So this company called Modern Meadow produced a steak chip, which is a very, very thin, like 0.5 milliliter, uh, millimeters thick tissue of meat. And they dried it, and I got to taste it. And it had the exact same mouthfeel as a potato chip, but it was 80% protein. And what I loved so much about eating that chip was that we can actually think about using these cultured products as a way to open up a whole new field of culinary opportunities where we don't have to just be imitating the products we're familiar with, but in fact, innovating into new realms of what uh, meat, milk, eggs, and all these other kind of products can indeed be. And then the third uh, cultured meat prototype 
I have to show because we're in Sweden, is a meatball. And this cell cultured meatball was the most recent uh, instance of cultured meat. And it was created by a team called Memphis Meats Now, where they cultured uh, pork and beef cells and put it together into a meatball and found that it, it fried up and brown just like a meatball. And it, it appeared to have a very similar uh, mouthfeel. Unfortunately, I didn't get to taste this one, but I will try to for the next round. Um, but I wanted to show this data about the cell cultured meatball where they, they swabbed um, the meat samples from conventional organic and the cultured meat. And of course, they found that cultured meat is very s sterile and that it doesn't have all these microbial uh, things growing on it. Um, which is something that is very important when we think about shelf life. So what is the shelf life of cultured meat? Does this mean that we can keep this meat around for longer and does that actually contribute to less food waste? These are the kind of things that we're excited about. I also wanted to show you what a muscle fiber looked like under the microscope just because it's very interesting. I should have put this beside another slide that showed what a uh, muscle cell grown in an animal looks like, but you'll have to trust me that it looks the same. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to go back quickly to the status quo. So here is some work that came from actually my undergrad university, the University of Alberta, where they keep various heritage birds. And on this side we have a chicken from 1950 and it is 70 days old. And it looks kind of like you know, a, a pigeon or a crow or a bird that we would normally see. And then beside that, we have a chicken from 2008, and that is at 48 days old. And there were no invasive genetic techniques that went into transforming the chicken this way. It was simply just choosing which two chickens we would breed with one another. So even without using very complex science, I guess if you, if you want to call it complex, we've already transformed animals effectively into bioreactors for creating meat. And specifically in North America, it's for creating chickens that produce a lot of chicken breast. So it's just something to, to point out that we've already transformed animals so much to be meat producing factories that why not we just abstract the animal altogether and create the meat producing factory much more directly. And so this is kind of a, a little diagram we put together to illustrate what that might look like. We would collect the initial sample of cells from a cow and culture those. Uh, we could culture those in a little petri dish uh, just to get our starter culture going. And that's an, actually a very ex important project that New Harvest is working on right now is establishing these starter cultures. So in, the, in most fields of research, you can order cells online very easily for all kinds of, like human stem cells, for example, or all kinds of medically relevant cell lines. But if you wanted to produce cultured meat in your lab, or in your university, you would have to go to a slaughterhouse and isolate those cells yourself, which means go to a slaughterhouse, ask someone to slaughter something for you, take those cells back, and, and start establishing a cell line over various number of months. And so one of the most the first projects that we're working on right now is establishing those cell lines so that people can just open a catalog and order a meat cell line so that they can begin doing this research on their own with a much lowered barrier to entry. And for us, this is very important to do as a nonprofit organization because this allows many people to participate in the production of meat in the future. Um, so after you have these starter cultures, you would move to these kind of large fermentation style looking tanks, I guess a lot like the breweries that I showed you earlier. And that would, be, that would allow us to produce these en masse. And from there, we could collect those cells and produce something like a hamburger. And maybe in the future, we, we uh, produce these things on scaffolds, which are kind of like a spongy type of materials that the cells will stick onto so that we can cr create these kind of chicken breasts or steaks or 3D tissue cultures. Um, the next thing I wanted to show you was the Mufri milk because I, I always like showing the, the actual products that are being created. So this is the milk that I described earlier, um, various samples of it. And the process for this is a little bit different than the one for tissue culture. Here, instead of the method of you know, mass producing female cows, making sure they're pregnant all the time so that they're always lactating. Instead, we simply take a yeast cell, insert the gene from, for cow casein, which you never actually have to interact with a cow. You just can, can look that up online, ultimately, and order this cell. And then you produce it in a fermentation tank, and then milk comes out at the end. 
And it's very, very important to remember that this is not an alternative. So all the people for whom nut milks are not an option because of allergies or other kinds of milks are not an option because they don't turn into yogurt or cheese, this milk will exactly do that. And because we, wanted, we were focusing on food, I wanted to close on this slide, which points out that cellular agriculture is much more than an effort towards sustainability or public health or the treatment of animals, but it's also a culinary opportunity. And several thousand years ago, before we invented fermentation, we could have never looked at a glass of milk. Well, I guess there wouldn't have been a glasses back then, but we could have never looked at milk and imagined that we wanted it to be solid or stinky or melty with bubbles in it. But because we were able to ferment, we could have all these different types of cheese. So as we introduce technologies like cellular agriculture, what are the new types of foods that we can't even imagine today that this technology will open up? And I'm very excited to taste what that future will be. So if you have any more questions or you want to learn more about what I do, please check out new-harvest.org. Thank you. Oops.